Hello boys and girls. In this video I will fairly quickly go through a bunch of theorems and metallurgical theorems that really anybody ought to know. Uh, they come in handy if you want to understand the description of computable functions um, through logic, first order logic in particular. I'm going to focus on arithmetic, in particular basically piano arithmetic without excluded middle, i.e. Heading arithmetic, um, but most of the things, as is often the case, in some way translate as well. These are, I call them freebies because these are all results uh, that that uh, grant you um, a bunch of uh, theorems that you might be familiar with, for example, from the uh, classical theory, piano arithmetic, but they grant you that they are also true if you don't use excluded middle or something like that. And in the end, um, we are also going to connect it in the other direction. We are going to discuss where the sort of the border is, where the magic starts with uh, classical logic and why. Okay, so uh, without further ado, let's jump into it. The first thing that I'm going to um, mention Right? I'm not proving the metaphoretical theorem here, but this is really something that that you ought to know if you um, if you take if you look at some theorem and you wonder uh, how far uh, can you get without without assuming such strong axioms and so on and so forth, and uh, how does that relate to computable functions? And these are the sort of things that you need to know. And the first thing here is the gödel gensen uh, translation. This is something which. Um, in some form holds for all first order theories. This is particularly simple for arithmetic, but um, and you can read up on it. I will state the uh, arithmetic form first and then um, see tell you how you generalize that a little bit. So basically, if you take any formula um, phi here, right? And uh, what, I, what I denote by, by this sequence of symbols is that if you take the formula and before every existential quantifier you add two negations, right, and you translated the formula, you got another formula. And the statement is that if piano arithmetic proves this statement, then the um, classically e equivalent statement with a few double negations inserted is provable in hiding arithmetic. Um, this, uh, firstly, this is very nice, right? Um, the, um, this is so concise because if you are doing arithmetic, then you can uh, define a bunch of log logical symbols and operations in, in other terms. And so that's um, why, in essence, um, this works with just uh, adding the double negations in front of the existential quantifiers. So in particular, right, as I demonstrate here, you know, in arithmetic, um, you can write down a proposition which is just, fa just false, namely the statement zero uh, equals one from the axioms. This is treated as basically the false formula that you don't want to prove. Otherwise, by explosion, everything is, is every, um, you know, every equality is, is true. So, um, this you know, right? If a, a, a proposition implies that zero is one, then the, um, the proposition is negated. And in that sense, because we have equality, we have zero and successor in the signature of the theory, you can write down the theory in a sense without any uh, negation signs. And similarly, you can uh, get rid of the disjunctions uh, as by treating them basically as a special case of an existential statement where, where there's just two things, not, you know, uh, for all, um, natural numbers one um, and so if you present arithmetic in this way very concisely then uh, the uh, good Gensel translation comes out just like that and um, more generally um, if you add double negations before existential quantifiers and um, disjunctions and atomic formulas then you also have this relation between the um, theory without excluded middle and the theory with excluded middle so uh, certainly good to know, it sort of implies that um, whenever you prove some uh, theorem in the theory, then you can get very far by just using constructive steps, right? And then at the end, you just re remove the double negations and then you have the classical result. Okay, so 
I have here some important, uh, I think, you know, to see them once at least, uh, formulas which are, you know, not predicate logic formulas, they're just propositional formulas, they're not even about um, arithmetic, but, you know, it's good to have, uh, you know, at least a feel how this works. In case you don't know the, these, um, to have a sort of uh, why, why double negation appears often and how it follows from sort of a implication calculus. Okay, I will very quickly uh, step through these, I don't know, five, uh, four or five lemmas here. Um, but I mean, you can read it up and think about it for yourself, but you basically just need the rules for implication and um, and disjunctions there. So the first statement is this here, that it says that this expression here in the bracket implies uh, Q. Um, I prove this because if the Q uh, proposition is a false proposition, right? If uh, P implies Q is just uh, the negation of P, then uh, this uh, becomes a special case double negation of ex um, excluded middle. And so this then basically, this proof, this one line proof here follow, uh, implies that in the constructive theory, um, the double negated excluded middle is also already everywhere true, right? So good to have that in mind um, to see how not too far away the constructive theory is from the classic one. Okay, so let's prove this. We prove this implication by assuming um, the uh, expression in the brackets here. Okay, the expression in the brackets is assumed. It implies that P implies Q, right? So this thing and this thing uh, both implying Q. So P implies Q, but if, if P implies Q, then also Q is implied, QED. Okay, um, the next um, statement is this here. And this is really just modus ponens. And again, if we do Q um, an absurd statement, then this says that any proposition implies its double negated form. Good. And thirdly here, um, if we have, uh, if you assume this thing here, right, there are three propositions, P, Q, R. Um, okay, let's assume this. Um, then the statement is that P implies R. Okay, so if we assume this and we assume P, then if, since we have assumed P, this thing holds, and this thing is exactly what is here in the bracket. So R follows QED. Okay, as a lemma, again, when we take the special case where Q and R are absurd statements, false statements, then we find this result, right? So that means a negated statement, you know, uh, not P for all P's, um, behaves classically in that sense. Right. This is also why you never see really free neg negations in some book on um, uh, these these logics. Um, and I, I mention it because it will be uh, important for the next um, sort of theorem, the next bullet point. Okay. So bonus theorem is by um, modus ponens here. If you also take this and and say um, Q is absurd, then you get the non-contradiction principle. Also quick proof. And finally, um, if we take the non-contradiction principle again for a negated statement, so if we look at this thing again, okay, or we look at this thing, then um, there's a valid De Morgan's law which you can use to pull out the negations from the conjunction. And this is also another way to get back at the double negated excluded middle, okay. Okay, so let's jump. You know, I, I told you this is going to be quick, but Gödel Gensen is probably the, the most important one, more or less, out of these four. Um, the second one is are are not. It's not one particular uh, methodological theorem. There are a bunch of um, statements that pertain to ha uh, Harop formulas, and I'm not really going to cite any in detail because they have to do with realizability and blah, blah. But um, the main thing uh, is th the, the one thing that I can state, which is also uh, sadly the only one that, you know, is, is on the Wikipedia page. There's a lot of, of uh, as I said, there's a lot of metalogical uh, um, statements to be made about these formulas. But the nice thing that uh, you should remember at least is that if you have any implication of this form, like P implies Q, and um, and Q is simple behaved, 
right, has no essential quanti quantifiers here, as I say, then this uh, this whole thing also behaves like a classical formula, right? So we had a special case of this here, where we said that a negated statement, if you um, if it's um, double negated, you know, a double negated uh, negated statement, so triple negated statement, um, then this is equivalent to the simply negated statement. So the, the negated statement implies uh, behaves classically, and you should really think of the negated statement as an implication of an absurd statement, right? You should think of p implies zero is one or something like that, right? And in this sense, this is exactly the case that we have here, right? So um, q in this case is a very trivial statement. It's just zero equals one. And that's sort of the generalized notion that if you have these uh, formulas where all the complications are in the hypothetical assumption, then this formula I write behaves under quotation marks because there's a lot of theorems associated with it, but things like double negation, um, elimination hold for them. Okay. So uh, this is also, this was one that was I think proven a little bit later than all the Gödel stuff, right? The Gödel did all the internistic logic and, and the modal logic theorems. You might get the feeling if you read uh, these books. Um, but this uh, came later. I think Friedman is still alive. So here is the statement. If you have a quantifier uh, free predicate, so there's no existential or universal quantifiers, you might also express this in terms of uh, primitive recursi recursive functions, right? I, I don't detail this in this video, but if you have um, a Turing machine, then that's equivalent to lambda calculus and that's equivalent to uh, rec recursive functions in the Turing sense, and then there's a uh, there's a procedure where you how you translate the um, an equation that uses the um, c program to a graph expressed in first order logic, and so then you can speak of uh, primitive recursive um, uh, predicates as well. Here I do the you know the pure no computation, no no computability theory, just the the normal logic language. I say it's a quantifier free, quantifier free formula. And here the result is, as you see, um, a formula of this, um, of this uh, um, form, you know, it basically says that, that uh, uh, Wi-Fi as a relation is total, this is the statement, if this is proven uh, classic, provable, provable classically, then it's already provable uh, constructively. I'm, I'm hoping I'm not mumbling too much, but I always try to train to, you know, keep these videos short. Maybe I manage to stay uh, under 25 minutes. We'll see. So, I mean, this is pretty nice because, I mean, this covers a whole lot of, of statements. Basically, all the uh, simple uh, function statements, simple computable function statements, yeah, give or take. We will see... Um, at the end of the video um, where the boundary is, where something classical can happen if you assume excluded middle. But this is a broad uh, scope. And in uh, in particular, if there's no extensional quantifier at all, or say differently, if there's just two options and not infinitely many possible um, numbers, um, then this is also like is a, this is a sort of a special case of this, and this is uh, then also true if it's true classically, which it is. Um, meaning, um, for example, you know the the standard statement that is usually made here is that if you have equality between two, two numbers, you know if var phi of n and m says n equals m, then this tells you that uh, equality of numbers is decidable, and there's also a very simple. Uh, inductive proof that this holds. Okay, so uh, also good to know. And then something which might be in some way obvious is that if you have a formula for which uh, the theory proves um, excluded middle, also in the predicative uh, fashion here, so for example, some primitive recursive predicate for this, does this hold? Um, then you can also remove the double negations before 
an existential closure of those. Um, and this can be understood as if you have a promise that it's impossible that no number exists that validate a statement, then number exists and the idea is that basically you can write a program which just uh, you know does a brute force search and if you know that it's impossible that it um, goes on forever then it must hold this is sort of the computable reading of this okay and you know if l let's say you have a statement where the um, this um, this junction here is not computably decidable for all numbers right? then we will see an example I mean spoiler the halting problem uh, goes in this direction then um, you might fail to prove this and then you might also fail to have this nice relation. Okay, so uh, these were the four um, statements that you sort of, I think they are, you can intuit them in a sense, right? And so you should be able to remember them and they will come in handy, especially whenever you have to deal with computational matters. Um, so now I want to delineate sort of what is actually, you know, if, if so many things are actually, you know, provable also without a clue in the middle, where is sort of the line or what are the sort of statements that um, that the classical magic gives you? Okay, so um, there's this uh, this statement. I, I, I'm coming here from Hilbert, Hilbert's tenth problem and its re uh, resolution. Um, the the resolu resolution of Hilbert's tenth problem is that, sadly, there are some very simple, very simple. There are some polynomial equations. They're very simple in the sense that, I mean, you just just have to plug numbers in and, and compute them. They are sort of uh, primitive recursive statements. Um, it's just uh, you know, plug and chuck. Uh, there are some polynomials p. For polynomials, you can evaluate what they evaluate to on the integers, say. And the statement is that there are polynomials where basically any theory um, you know that captures problems on arithmetic let's say it's a Miller Frankel theory or any of the arithmetic theories we discuss here that whether or not there is an input value for the polynomial such the polynomial is zero right whether or not there's a zero for the polynomial that this statement is independent of the theory so for example in Zemelo Frankel choice set theory, there is some polynomial such that Zemelo Frankel choice does not prove that zero exists or zero does not exist. Um, and e even more, you can actually then prove that um, for uh, interesting statements, there is then an equivalent equivalence to this, this to between these independent existence statements and this other uh, proposition which has a little bit more you know in content that you can interpret and in, in particular you can uh, write the inconsistency of the theory at hand as the existence claim so existence of n for the uh, of the zero for the polynomial would be an inconsistency of the theory right it's it's sort of if you think about these things if you take some things away from this video what helps a little bit, I found, to um, think about all this, you know, consistency stuff is to recognize that the inconsistency uh, existence is sort of positive, uh, formulated as the positive statement. If something exists, which is the, basically the proof of the inconsistency, then then the bad thing happened. So the, I'm, I'm pointing this out because inconsistency already sounds like the negation of something, but uh, logically speaking, it's sort of the other way around. The positive statement is the existence of the inconsistency, and there's no negation involved yet. And um, then um, the uh, consistency can be expressed as the negation of the existence of an inconsistency, right? Um, and uh, um, it's, it's relevant because um, it helps with the classification in the arithmetic hierarchy of the statement. So in particular, the uh, consistency statement with this polynomial is a Goldbach type uh, formula. So it's a, uh, a Pi 1 formula. And as we have seen, for example, here with the uh, conservativity, this 
this this is re relevant in which level this is because you know if you have some formula and you know the where it is in the hierarchy then you you can at least guess in which direction um probability results go um so you know uh this is independent so that not provable or rejectable so the sort of maybe surprising statement is that already an uh for this pi one statement, you f find one which is not provable or rejectable, um, and and so I'm not going to discuss this in this video. But a nice constructive the uh, theories like um, arithmetic, also set theory. I mean, unless you do something wrong, but if you have some um, some nice set theory like con constructive Zermelo Frankel, then this theory will have the numerical existence property and the disjunction property, which basically means that if a disjunction is proven, A or B, um, then either A or B is actually provable. So because of this, if this thing is classically, uh, even classically independent, then the disjunction, you know, um, consistency is provable or uh, the negation uh, of this statement is provable. This will not be provable in the constructive theory, right? Because the, the constructive theory is meta metalogically nice. If the constructive theory proves the disjun disjunction, then it, actu it actually proves either of these um, of these uh, disjuncts. And so, because these individual things are in the, uh, independent, the constructive theory does not prove this excluded middle uh, statement. And in fact. Since, uh, as I emphasized, the consistency is actually a negation, this is actually a very, like, a, it's a weak on uh, excluded middle statement even, right? This is um, not some primitive statement or not not some primitive statement. So here, um, weak excluded middle breaks down. And we can even say more because this is a Goldbach statement. We are, it's even more refined, right? So it says, not some for all statement or not not some for all statement this thing which is relatively simple you would think is already failing and this is a failure of what amounts to um uh, weak lesser principle of uh, omniscience but okay i'm not going to get into that now uh, and now for the last sort of page um you might know the halting problem uh, states that for an index of a program, so basically of a program and an input uh, x, um, it is not computably decidable uh, whether or not when you take the function and run the uh, input on it, whether this will come to a halt or not, right? This is uh, uh, computably enumerable, but it's not computable, you cannot, decide membership you can only decide if something is in it i have a whole video on that where i do explicitly the dovetailing you can make the positive statements but you cannot really make the negative statements um, to formalize this you have this uh, cleany predicate t this says um, given a program e and an input n there exists a computer computing history this is basically a log statement like whenever you do something in the program you lock it and then you can like step through the log and see does it all, all make sense and if uh, if this sort of log um, exists and a log you know has a start somewhere and end somewhere if a log exists that describes the computing history of this um, function e on x then this um, holds so this statement is basically the halting statement and this thing is not a computable set, okay? And so we can um, use this statement to define a predicate now. This is a little bit more general in a sense than the good thing that we just discussed. Um, you have a predicate uh, that makes the claim that um, a function holds on its own index. And similarly, um, the negation here, you know, I say this for hold and I say this for loop, it goes on forever, right? It says uh, it's not the case that there is uh, a lock that validates that the function when ran on its own index eventually holds. And since uh, this, like by the, 
essentially by the consistency of church thesis, the formal one, um, these things are not uh, provable in the uh, in a constructive theory, and especially not in um, heading arithmetic. And so here is also a, a failure, not just of an excluded middle statement, but in a sense of infinitely many, right, of a quantified form. Um, yeah, so it is not provable because there is no computable function which decides, you know, the left or the right hand sides. There's sort of no bivalent function that does this job. And because uh, our theory here is consistent with the consistent with the assumption that all functions are really computable in a Turing sense, this is actually not provable. Um, and there is this thing called uh, the formal church thesis. I should really make a video on that which there's uh, like a million formulations of it but in en essence it says that um that all total relations are sort of um oh, uh, inhabited by also uh, uh, a computable function so if you have any um uh, two re predicate so a predicate with input and output and you, uh, your theory already proves that it is total, then the theory, when, when uh, this principle holds, um, will also prove that there is a function which corresponds to that. You could think of it as saying that if something, some relation in your logic is not Turing computable, then it's not really provable at all, right? It sort of restricts um, what can be provable by saying the whole world is sort of, there's just uh, computable functions and not hypercomputable functions in a sense. Um, and um, so this thing happens to be consistent with um, many nice uh, constructive theories. And if that is the case, I don't do the proof here, but you can read it up in, for example, in uh, this re reference here, basically, basically all I discussed in this video, you will find in this uh, very nice book. Um, but I mean, nothing I did here was sort of, there's no, there's no magic or something. This is all, all very, very, uh, straightforward, um, in a sense, if you adopt this principle that everything should really be computable, if you're like sort of restrict the world, then the classical function that, you know, the, the quotes and quotes function that takes a program and returns zero or one if the program holds on its own input, right? Something we know we cannot Turing compute. Um, if we say this is not a function at all, then um, the, this classical f function idea, this much more freer function idea, like you know, as I said, this sort of hyper -compute computation object, which is everywhere in classical logic, uh, cannot exist. And so very explicitly, this theory with this extra assumption disproves this form of um, weak excluded middle. Okay, I'm running out of battery, so um, with that, I, I leave it. I hope you learned something, and um, if you want to know more, then let me know in the in the comments. But I, there is a lot of lot of things to say, and I might make more videos. I'm very glad I, I stayed under half an hour. So, with that, <laughs> take care.